So this is lecture 18 of 5312. And so we're going to, so it's, it's kind of funny, like lectures 16, 17, 18 kind of build upon each other. So this lecture, we will talk about pairwise error probability. Hmm. We'll talk about pairwise error probability and the error vector diagram. And we, we, let's, let's actually draw this. And I'm, I know you guys can't see. Ah, so what we'll do. is the following. So let's say that's S1, that's SJ, that's the origin, okay? And what happens is, uh, just as mentioned before, we receive a vector, R, and we assume that S1 is transmitted, okay? So what we do is, first of all, we know that the noise has displaced that signal. So what we do is, first of all, we create a new vector, Sj minus S1. That's this guy here. Then what we do is we say, okay, well, delta SJ is going to be equal to SJ minus S1 divided by D1J. And what that guy is going to look like is this. So that is delta SJ. Now, when I do delta sj dot n, what, what that gives me is the projection of n onto this line. And this is some sort of like unit vector, right? And so now what's interesting is suppose I have this distance. So this distance here is d 1j, an error situation occurs when the projection of the noise is greater than the halfway mark of this thing. So if let's say that's a halfway mark and the noise gets projected down onto this line, and let's say this line is of length d1j, if it's less than the halfway mark, no error. Because that means this head, this R, will get mapped or be decided. It's closer to S1 than it is to SJ. On the other hand, if this noise the projection of the noise vector exceeds the halfway mark, error, bad, right? Because it's that means R is being mapped to SJ. So through this diagram, what we have here essentially is now a quantitative way, using vector and linear algebra means, of saying, OK, if I know what the noise vector is, I know what all my signal constellation points are in space, I can actually give you a numerical value of, like, you know, like, you know projecting your, your noise down onto this guy. Is it above or below the 50% mark? And if it is, error. If not, no error. So going back to the doc cam. We make several assumptions. The probability of error is the same for any SJ. And, and that, does, like, you know, the reason why we say that is, like, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily need to. Like, uh, like, uh, like, for instance, we, we're choosing, like, you know, I love this term, without loss in, of generality. Oh, I love that term. It's such a great assumption. If you ever want to have a PhD thesis, Find some conference paper and where they say without loss in generality and dig a little deeper and see if it actually does mean it, okay? And then if it's not, then hey, that could be a really big nugget of thesis research right there. Now, we make this assumption that, you know, we look at S1 and we transmit S1 and what's the perspective 
in terms of error probability relative to transmitting S1. And then we assume that the, the error performance of transmitting S1 and receiving successfully S1 will be the same as if I choose S2 as being transmitted and we do the same thing all across all the signal constellation. And S3 and S4 and S5. But in reality, that may or may not be true. It may not be reciprocal, right? So for this calculation, we make, we, we're making that assumption. We, we will say, let's say without loss in generality, we choose S1 for now, right? We can choose any S, but let's choose this one. And we have that projection. The key here is I want you guys to solve the probability. So if we go back to what I just drew, drew over here on the uh, computer, we know that n is a vector. n is a random vector. It's a noise vector. It has Gaussian elements. Or maybe they do. We have to derive that, right? So what we want to do is we want to come up with a way of calculating the probability, we want to base, so let me draw that. We want to come up with what is the probability that this happens? What is the probability that the noise bumps that R vector to be closer to SJ than S1? What is random here? Well, this guy's not random, but noises. And so what is this guy? This guy is going to be a vector. It's going to be n1, n2, n3, n-dimensional, right? And each one of these elements, as it will turn out, because what we're doing is we're mapping from n of t to this vector, we're going to see if n of t is awgn, that these guys are going to be Gaussian, and they'll have a certain statistic. And what we're going to find out, this is really cool. So I don't know how to do Draw it. I'm going to do my best, but I'm going to first of all give you a sort of a mental image. I'm going to use hand waving as my, my technique. And what happens is, what we're going to see is that the way that S1, if we transmit it, is displaced, is going to be Gaussian. It's going to be a Gaussian vector of it in any direction. And the intensity, the distance that is traveled, will have a multi dimensional Gaussian distribution. So how does it look like? It'll look like this. OK, so brace yourself. I, I, let's use this color here. It'll look like the following. So let's say it's going to look like basically what's going to look like is in this case, we're talking about two dimensions, but it could be any dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions. What happens is the height of the mountain tells you with what probability the displacement will occur by that noise vector, right? So what happens is above S1, if I transmit S1, what happens is you have this Gaussian mountain on top of it. It tells you with what likelihood that S1 will be displaced by that amount away from the S1 original position, from its resting point, right? And so you can imagine what's going to happen. Oh, so I'm, I'm basically, I'm sort of jumping way ahead, but I can't hold the surprise. It's really, really cool. So what happens is, suppose if you look down. So here is, that's S1, the vector, S2, the vector. And so let's say the decision region is that, right? Now, let me draw the Gaussian mountain. So the noise, let's say I transmit S1. The way, what you would do in order to calculate the probability that the noise is so bad that it will displace S1 into deciding it's actually S2 is the integral, volume integral, underneath that curve. But what's kind of interesting is, look what we're doing here. So that's complicated. We're doing a volume integral. What we can do instead is, if we have, and this is another motivation why we care about that line, 
is we're projecting that vector onto a single line, so we need to find out what the equivalent random, what the distribution is, and there we'll find out that's also a Gaussian. All you have to do is integrate underneath the tail, right? So the decision region really is, if we have noise, it will look like this, like a, a bell curve, right? But what we really care about is just this half and how much, like, you know, this point on to the end. This will tell us the same amount of information, what's the likelihood. Because what happens is, let's say the noise projects there, the noise projects there, the noise projects there, the noise projects there. It doesn't matter. I want to project all of those possible locations for R onto this line. And then from there, I can calculate what the probability of error is. All right? So I know, so much color. OK. So our objective is to find this error scenario. So I can calculate the volume underneath the Gaussian dome. Or I can just find out what is the probability of error of this situation, which will be a Gaussian vector that gets projected onto a line, okay? which is deterministic. OK, so this is where the gory mathematics comes in. Oh, math, yes. OK. The mathematics is that, first of all, we have a zero mean vector. And we also assume that all the elements of the vector are uncorrelated, so, um, which means in Gaussian, means are independent, which means that only the main diagonal of the correlation matrix is non-zero, right? Which we have here. So I n by n is an identity matrix, and the diagonal is n naught over 2, and its upper and lower triangles are 0. So what we now do is, OK, we take that z thing, right? And, and what we want to do is we represent the dot product of n, the noise vector, onto the delta sj vector, unit vector. We represent as z. And now we go through the same thing we did before. Dot product, what type of operator it is? Linear. Expectation, linear. So what is the expectation of z? is the expect expectation of n dot delta sj. Delta sj, random? No, deterministic. n, random. So the expectation just operates on n. Zero mean vector. This is a zero vector. Now we calculate what the variance is of this. And it's the same rigmarole. And at the end of the day, what we do is we actually get this cool thing. We basically get the product. It's a dot product of, no, not dot product, sorry. It's the, the unit vector transposed with itself, multi, transposed multiplied by itself times n naught over 2. So this will give us the new correlation matrix, right? So. Now we have all of this. What we see is that in the end, if you do, like, let's say we let the variance, okay? So we can see that the variance here is actually equal to n naught. And you might say, okay, why is that? So what happens is it's, it's all mathematical trickery. So let's say we take, um, so we're assuming a column vector, right? So what's a transpose of column vector? Row vector. What happens when you have row vector multiplied by column vector in that order? You get a scalar, right? So it's equal to a dot product. And that dot product, if you expand it out, the definition of what the delta sj vector is, you have this. Oh my god, it's 1. It's unity. Yay. So if you do that, what you end up getting is this beautiful decision metric. So you get this, oh, sorry, so this error situation, which is the error, like let's say I transmit 1, and it gets decoded as a j. So that is equal to when z is greater than or equal to the halfway mark on the line between s1 and sj. 
and we know what the statistics of z are now, we go back to probability. Let's, I know people hate it when it's like, oh, go back to probability. But it really is going back to probability. So this is the error situation. Oh. <laughs> That's a little bit weird. So z, if z, which is the projection of n onto delta sj, is greater than or equal to d1j over 2, we got an error. This is our error situation. Right? Now, we know that this guy's Gaussian, zero mean, sigma squared. So now, what is the probability that this happens? I.e., what is the probability of this error situation? And so we know that this is Gaussian, and this is some deterministic value. So this is going to be equal to, so z, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So d1j divided by 2 to plus infinity, 1 over, right, e to the minus, right? And so if we have that, just like everything else. So remember the definition of Q function. And what ends up happening is the result, it turns out, like, expression. And this is a beautiful result, right? So this tells me what is the probability of error, that specific error situation for that specific separation distance between 1 and j. So now you can imagine we can now scale this to all pairings, right? 1 and i, 1 and j, 1 and k, all of those guys. Beautiful. OK. So the problem, and the problem is with respect to you know, we have all these guys, and as I mentioned before, we're trying to approximate things. What we're trying to do is we're trying to develop bounds to sort of, you know, make sort of like these reasonable shortcuts, if you will, that can uh, sort of make our lives easier, and yet give us an approximate idea of how our system's performing. So let's take an, let's, so what happens is we don't need something exa exact. But usually what happens is um, bounds at least tell us your error cannot exceed this. Your error will never be this low. Your, like, you know, if I know what I cannot do above a certain region, then that's great. Like For instance, when I went car shopping this weekend, oh, I love this. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, go car shopping, and so you see, Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price, or MSRP. So any of you that are trying to buy a car, if you see that, absolutely under no circumstances pay that price. That's your upper bound. Unless the thing's a Ferrari, that's the upper bound, right? What happens is, you, and, and it's kind of cool, because then what happens is the dealer will say, oh, yeah, 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 no one ever pays that. This is what I actually paid. This is the dealer invoice price. So that's another number, and it looks like it's $1,000 less. Don't pay that number, because that's not really what they're paying. You've got to go below that, right? So, that's, so, so, here's, so, 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 so think about it. There's something called a weak bound and a, and a strong bound, a tight bound. So the MSRP, that is a weak bound. That's like, 
uh, like you know, you like you really, you know, you're like there's no way in the world the price you're paying for that car is going to come close to that unless it's extremely rare or it's extremely expensive or whatever. Okay. And then the dealer price, that's a tighter bound. That's closer to ballpark where you're going to be paying. Maybe, and, and depends on how much wiggle room. Unfortunately, um, Toyotas are one of the few categories where it's actually difficult to wiggle down the price. They're, they're, you, know, they're you know, because it's a good product, right? All right. So what happens is we do the same thing with probability of errors. Sometimes we say, where, where's like that bound? I don't care how tight or how weak. Like, you know, like, let's say, what am I absolutely certain this will never exceed? And then you do some calculations, very simple, and for sure, my error performance will never exceed this bound. Okay? But let's say, what is the likelihood of my error performance ever reaching it? Probably never. It's like so loose, right? Like, you know, it's like impossible. Like, you know, for instance, if I wanted to jump, it's like, oh, let's put a bound. Professor Roglinski, no way in the world he can jump 20 feet in the air. Yeah, you're right. I don't think I can jump 20 feet in the air unless that's superhuman strength. But what happens is that's a pretty loose bound. What's the probability that Professor Wiglinski can't jump more than seven feet? Well, let's see how I could, that could be accurate. Like, let's say you break both my ankles. Yeah, I'll probably have a little bit of difficulty, but that's a very tight bound, right? So in this case, let's say we, we use an MPSK transmission. So there are M signal constellation points, all of them equidistant from the origin, which means they all have the same energy. Now, let's find out what the pairwise error probability is. This is kind of a not nice example because it's sort of angularly displaced and it's, it's messy. It's like law of cosines everywhere. So what do we do? So what we want is we want to establish an upper bound for the probability of error. One way of doing it is the following. So let's say you have your reference signal without loss in generality. Let's use S1. And an error event occurs when at least one of these events occur. So what does that mean? So what happens is all I care about is I want to find a scenario where I have at least one of these pairwise error probabilities being an error. In reality, there's a possibility but that my noise displaces the S1 transmitted so far away from S1, it actually maps closer to two, three, four, five, six signal constellation points rather than S1. I don't care. All I care about is I have an error when at least one says error, right? And, there's, and it's interesting because what happens is when we do that, it's really, do I have an error here? No. Do I have an error here? Do I have an error here? Yes. <coughs> error. How does that get translated? It's a union, right? Here, so, so take the pairwise error probability. 1 and 2. Is there an error? Or 1 and 3. Or 1 and 4. All the way to 1 and m which we can signify basically sort of a union of all scenarios. And put the probability theory back in. This, the reason why I want to write it like this is because this is classic. What's the probability of the union of a whole bunch of events? This is where we play with that little probability stuff, okay? So how does this look like? So remember, oh, remember that the union of the of A plus the probability of B minus their intersection. Ah, yes. And remember, uh oh, this is where the bound is forming. That will be less than the probability of A plus the probability of B. So what happens is if you disregard the fact that there might be some intersection between A and B, your probability, union, the probability of unions, 
if you let them equal to the individual probability summed together and you don't care about their intersections, you're going to have a larger value than it is. But that, that's what the bound is, right? Because imagine you had to calculate the, all the intersections, it might not be trivial. And is it really worth your time? And the answer is maybe. Well, it depends how tight a bound you need. If you need a bound, if you need an exact value. But here, what happens is if I say, oh, I just need approximately. What type of error performance are we talking about? Do it in the next 15 seconds. You would do that. Right? 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 OK. So we call this the union bound. Oh, the union bound. And so the union bound, the probability of error is equal to the probability of an error event happening, which is equal to the probability that I have at least one error happening anywhere between one, the transmitted point, and any one of the other signal constellation points. And that is going to be less than or equal to the sum of all the individual probability of errors. Cool. I'm ignoring there any sort of overlap, any sort of inter between the different in uh, events. Okay? So this is great. This sets the upper. Now, we, so we had this guy. Look how easy, right? So if you remember, oh yeah, pairwise error probability is the Q function of the square root of D1J divided by N naught 2, right? Okay, in 15 seconds, tell me what my performance will be if I have like, let's, let's say, okay guys, 64 QAM. Oh, no, no, that's too easy. How about 64 PSK? Find out what the uh, error performance is. What is the, wor what, where can I, what, what's the bound? What's, what's the, like, the, the, the worst that I can do, possibly, right? And then what do you do that? Sum up them all together. Because then, if I take that into consideration, the bound is no longer bound. It's an exact expression. But can you do that in 15 seconds? Absolutely not. Right? Ah, so let's do an example. So I think, um, yeah, Mustafa, you, you, you asked about, again, like, distances and stuff, right? Ah. So what we've got, ah, QPSK modulation. And on the side here, in the bottom right part of the slide, that's how your Q function behaves as a function of the input X. Look how steep it gets, right? And the further you go, the steeper it gets, ah, and falls off, right? So what happens is you look at the distances. You have D1, 2, D1, 4, and then D1, 3. And right away, we see that D1, 3 is way farther apart. It's way bigger than D1, 2, D1, 3, D1, 4. So if you do the union bound on this guy, what do you have? So you know that. We have the two pairwise error probabilities, right? So we take out of our hat. We know it's Q, the square root of D1J. So in this case, D12 and D14 squared divided by 2N0. And then we have this straggler, D13 here. And what happens is we can approximate that guy as being negligible. Because imagine if, like, let's say this is where D12 and D14 squared is, and D1 3 is here, that, that could be like several orders of magnitude lower. That guy is pretty much zero. Like it's, it's tiny in comparison. So we can approximate our bound even more. So it's a little looser, but just by a little bit. And then you can also do even weaker upper bounds than this. What happens is all you may want to do is let's say you approximate, let's say you approximate all the sort of error problem, uh, you know, these error events as being almost like what you do is you find instead of like like let's say you just keep it simple so let's say you look at this guy and you say okay that's d min that's d min right that's not d min of course but what you can do is you can say okay instead of calculating each thing because let's say say you have 15 seconds just find a d min plug that in, 
multiply by all the pairwise error probabilities and you got their answer. That's also, that's totally le legit. And in fact, that also gives you not such a great answer too, right? But that's fine because it's a bound. It doesn't have to be exact. So what we've just seen in this lecture is we've gone from the error vector diagram and how we translate an error event in terms of, into like a probability expression. And then what we did is we, we took that error performance metric for pairwise error probability and instead of finding the exact expression for, uh, uh, for an M signal constellation point modulation scheme, we found the bound instead. So the assignment that will be, po not the assignment, the problem set of solutions that will be posting online tomorrow morning will, will really sort of test your understanding of this, these sort of concepts. So it's going to be a little bit mathy. Okay? So that, folks, uh, concludes uh, lecture 18. Okay. Whoo! <laughs>